We are in our Advent series. We're going to be in uh, Luke chapter 2. We're on the theme of joy. Uh, you know, at the uh, end of the worship set there, we sang, Oh, Come All Ye Faithful, which some of you grew up singing, some of you did not grow up singing. But if we had a time machine here and we could go through the time machine and we were able to step back six or seven hundred years, most scholars think that song was written at least 800 years ago. If we were to go back 700 years before the Reformation, before the Renaissance, and we were to go to Asia Minor, or we were to go to North Africa, or we were to go to even parts of Mesopotamia, there's a, there is a decent chance that around this time of year, that uh, as we walked into a, a small gathering of followers of Jesus on a, on a Sunday, and they would have been gathering on Sunday, we might not recognize the clothes. Uh, we might, you might feel like you know, Latin was the language they were speaking in. You might not recognize the language. You might not recognize very much, but you, you might hear a tune similar to that as people say, sang that very same song, whether you were in... Uh, the Ural Mountains, or North Africa, or Asia Minor, or Mesopotamia, uh, you might very well find followers of Jesus singing that song, and this morning you might very well hear them talking about the hope of Jesus coming, uh, because again, it has been centuries and centuries and centuries that followers of Jesus have celebrated Advent, have, have marked the beginning of the Christmas season with these core themes, the, the sort of deep meaning, and, um, and in places where they didn't have books, uh, one of the ways people remembered things was to year after year go through the same themes till it was just ingrained in their lives. That when we talk about the coming of Jesus, we, we are talking about hope for the whole world. When we talk about the coming of Jesus, we're talking about peace on earth. And when we talk about the coming of Jesus, we're talking about joy. We're, we're talking about a kind of joy that's not found anywhere else. And so we, again this morning, we, we join with followers of Jesus around the world and through the centuries uh, walking through Advent together, which I think is one of the real privileges of, of gathering. Uh, this week I got an email that was a... A birth announcement, a a friend is uh, due to have a child uh, next year, and it was one of those, we're not telling everybody yet kind of emails. Have you gotten those, or, or, you know, a a birth announcement that's, you know, we're letting you know, but uh, we haven't told him, you know, we're not telling everybody yet, so keep it quiet. And I remember the conversations with Michelle when, you know, when we uh, first found out we were pregnant, and you you get to that point, when are we going to tell people? I don't, some of you have had these conversations and some of you have not, but, you know, for most of us, the first months of pregnancy are just uncertain enough that you don't, you know, you don't raise the flag on the first day and you think, who are we going to tell? And you maybe tell your close friends and part of you wants to put like a, you know, a, a billboard in your front yard, you know, it, it consumes your life. Like, would it be over the top to just purchase a billboard that says we're going to have a child? And then part of you doesn't want to tell anybody because it's so just private and, and uncertain and tenuous and miraculous and hard to get your head around. And, and then eventually you let people know and you usually start with the people you care about the most, the people you trust the most. And, and honestly, just I think part of the tentativeness, the, the, the part that if, if for some, you know, tragic reason there's a disappointment, the, the people who would care for you. you. You start with the people you really trust. You start with your closest friends, and then, you know, usually uh, even before you start telling people, word does get out through your well-meaning friends who cannot keep a secret, and it just uh, spreads out there. We're going to read this morning a birth announcement, a birth announcement. Uh, we're going to look at Luke 2 and the announcement of Jesus' birth, and I think it's very interesting who God chooses to disclose the news to first. It is not the, the powerful. It's not the people who dedicated their lives to the temple. It's, it's not the people you, you might expect. It, it is a group of shepherds, and we'll talk some about what it means to be a shepherd uh, today in the ancient world, uh, but it's, it's to the shepherds, and they hear this announcement of Jesus' birth, and it's an announcement of great joy given by angels uh, as they're just going about their work in the middle of the night, out in the fields. And so I want to pray, and and this morning the message is simply titled, The Joy of Christmas, and we'll look at Luke 2 this morning. Uh, 
Lord, I ask as we read your word that the joy of your coming would fill our hearts. Lord, for those of us who have known you for years, I ask this morning for a fresh, a fresh look at joy, Lord. That anything that's gotten worn and routine about following you would, would come alive again this morning in a fresh way. And Lord, for those of us who may not know you or may just be checking out spirituality, Lord, I ask that you would pull back the curtains of heaven, Lord, and that Jesus, you would meet us this morning clearly. So Holy Spirit, would you come now? In your name, Jesus. Amen. So beginning in verse 1 of Luke chapter 2, in those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire world. This was the first census that took place while the man whose name starts with Q was governor of Syria. And everyone went to their own town to register. So Joseph went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him, and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them. They were terrified. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Today, in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has revealed to us. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child, and all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. All right. Well, this passage is wonderful. You've heard it. You know, um, this is a a Charlie Brown episode. It's in lawns across San Diego. It's pictured all the time. It's it's familiar even if you are very new to church. You have, you have probably seen a, a manger scene that, that captures this passage. And yet I, I hope this morning that we can uh, look at it through fresh eyes. There's a word in the passage that occurs three times, and I want to begin just by thinking about that word. It's manger, manger, feeding trough. You could picture, picture in your mind a, an animal uh, feeding trough, a place where... Uh, goats, probably a low trough, uh, a, a place where, where, where goats or perhaps donkeys would come to get their food. And, and sometimes this is pictured, some, some translations say there was, there was not room in the inn. So sometimes people picture this like Mary and Joseph came into town, into Bethlehem, and you know, a holiday inn was full, and and Howard Johnson's was full, and, and finally they got just a, a back room kind of in the parking lot of a smaller inn. Uh, but this is almost certainly not a commercial inn. There's another word in Greek, Luke uses in Luke, in the parable of the Good Samaritan. There's another word for commercial inn. This is a, this, there's no room in the guest room. This is a family house. It's all, very common in the ancient world for, their, for houses to have two stories, one that had the living space, and, and beneath that would be where the animals lived. In Southeast Asia, when we take teams to Southeast Asia, many of us have stayed in houses just like this. There'd be one or two rooms in the house, and underneath the floor is where all the animals are and where the feeding troughs are, and, 
And that's probably what we want to picture. We want to picture a, a feeding trough down with the family animals. It might have been relatives of Joseph, Joseph and Mary, one or, one or the other. It might have been friends of family in that world, uh, you know, as in much of the developing world, like everybody's cousins, you know, everybody. So probably, probably they're visiting a family member as they go to participate in the census. And underneath the house, there, there's a feeding trough. And in that feeding trough is laid a baby that is the sort of the turning point of the whole Gospel of Luke. In that feeding trough, we find Jesus lying, just wrapped in claws. And, and it's about Jesus that the angels say, we have a message for you. It's good news of great joy, and I love this phrase, that will be for all people. Like everybody. Like nobody's left out. Like the good news is for everybody. On every continent from every time period, of every language. I was just heartbroken again and again. The news this week seemed divisive, where it's like the gospel's for one group. You know, you got the crazy Christians over here. Then you have the rest of the people, often portrayed as the sane people. And there's just like no, no touch point. But, but uh, the gospel is that the, the good news of Christmas, it's for everybody. And it's of a, a great joy. Of great joy. And so underneath this passage uh, is, is this key insight that Jesus is the source of life's deepest joy. Here's the great joy in life. How, and, and the shepherds are trying to figure out what this means for them. And the shepherds are going to go and, and follow up on what the angels say to them. But they hear that this is going to be great joy as they try to get their heads around it. The first thing they they find out is that the gateway to great joy, the, the road to great joy, it leads through Jesus. This child who's born uh, is, is the source of it all. And we're going to unpack that this morning. Um, but we, we miss the whole thing if we miss Jesus. I want to start, though, by exposing just one myth about joy. I've called it a lesson from the shepherds. Uh, or just take a couple minutes on shepherds in the ancient world. If you were to you know, picture a ladder of success. We have that metaphor, right? A ladder of success. And, and in today's culture, if you were to just imagine the rungs of the ladder, like the jobs that are good and the jobs that are bad. And in our world up at the top, you know, I'm not going to list all the jobs. I don't want to create anxiety in the room. But I know our kids' teachers tell all three of our kids, you should be an engineer. Like, if you get a degree in mathematics, if you go in engineering, you're going to have a great job. It kind of doesn't matter. Like, that, that in our culture, that's a good job. If you, you know, doctors and lawyers get enough money that they, they have freedom, like, those are, those are good jobs in our culture. They're near the top, and then you go down, and you go down, and you go down. And somewhere, I, you know, one job that's near the bottom, I think, is migrant worker in our culture, isn't it? Like, fruit picker is near the bottom. It might not be the very bottom, but it's... It's near the bottom. Most teachers don't tell their students, you should aspire. If you could be a trash collector, you would be so happy. You should aim at that. You know, just, just focus your mind. When you graduate, you could go on to be a trash collector. That's, that's not what they hear. That's near, that's not, you know, I don't want to say the bottom, but those are jobs that, People don't love. In the ancient world, shepherd would be one of those bottom rung, like the very bottom rung. They didn't own land. They were seen as dirty and unclean. Safety was in the cities and in the, outside the city walls at night. Bandits and brigands could come get you. Wild animals were all over the place in ancient Israel. Like there was real danger, like you could get eaten if you fell asleep on the job. That's a serious job hazard, right? Shepherds, uh, shepherds had hard lives. Shepherds had unclean lives. Shepherds had, even by ancient standards, it was cold and tough to live outside every night with animals, trying to keep the animals and yourself alive without being robbed, with no real sense of security. Shepherds were that job that, like, absolutely nobody was jealous of shepherds. Nobody woke up in the morning and thought, boy, I really hope my kids could grow up to be one of those dirty shepherds that lives 
out. And, th- and there were joking phrases about shepherds in the ancient world because they, they were just seen as those kind of, you know, foul people out in the hills trying to survive at night. So uh, my joy, the myth is my joy depends on my circumstances. My joy depends on my circumstances, which I think is is a big deal in our culture, right? Many of us, many of us have had that thought, like if I could get like that promotion, if I could graduate and get into that job, if, if I could be, go from being single to being happily married, I would experience the joy in life that I've been longing for. If I could see, you know, at this age in life, I think if I could see my kids happily get into some kind of stable career, like the failure to launch thing. If I could know that I'm going to be a parent where my three kids get off, that would, that would feel like really great for, for some of us. Um, you know, there's dreams. Like if I could just have that status change, I would finally have some joy. And I think that, that's one of those signs that many of us attach joy to our circumstances. Like, what are my life circumstances? Like, that's where I'm looking. Another way I see this is that in our culture, a lot of times we chase joy by, by seeking experiences. My, uh, one, one story, many of you know that uh, Michelle and I were just celebrating our 20th anniversary. We went on a little over a week trip to Costa Rica. Please, if you're married, celebrate anniversaries. Go do something fun. At one point, I, I posted a, a little video of this on Facebook, so I know some of you have seen it. We did a zip line thing. It's like the home of zip lines. And we're standing ne- in line for a 1.6 kilometer zip line across a canyon. And I'm scared of heights. And I had that much, like, this will be fun. Michelle loves adventure. And then I'm looking at this thing go out over a canyon, and people disappear so you can't even see them anymore on the zip line. And I have this feeling like, what are we doing right now? What are we doing? <laughs> I'm waiting in line. I paid for this. <laughs> like, I'm about to be like so far out over a canyon that I can't see anything else. I'm just attached by my back. I'm just going to get hung on a line like a piece of clothing weighted and just God knows what's going to happen to me out over that canyon. <laughs> And then people are telling us it's a good thing you came in early December because, you know, high season's coming and it's like really hard to get, you know, these things fill up. Like all over the world, people are coming here to hang themselves on a line and go out over a canyon. But, and it was fun, so go do it, you know, it's, it, it was all right. But I think what's happening is we are a culture that like pursues experience, don't we? Like that sense of escape, that sense of exhilaration. Like how do, I, how do I go after life? How do I go after joy? And it's really interesting to me that the shepherds, uh, it's, it's right in the middle of their nightly routine. It's not on some kind of religious pilgrimage. It's not some place where they were seeking a, a spiritual high or an emotional high. It, it's not like they got promoted from being shepherds to living in the city and having secure lives. It's right in the middle of their daily routine. The good news of great joy comes to them. And that they experience a joy that the rest of the people in that culture could only dreamed of. So this equation, better experiences equal more joy. I think this passage makes us want to really, better circumstances rather. I think we really want to rethink that entirely uh, if we're paying close attention to this. And, and so let's take a window kind of into joy. Let's look through the shepherd's eyes this morning. I, I want to just sort of draw three observations about the, the deep reality of the, the joy of Christmas. And the, the first one is that the joy of Christmas is it's something that's revealed to us. It's not something that we work towards. It's not something that we figure out. The shepherds did not uh, sit down with sort of Hebrew Bible passages and figure out the meaning of joy. The shepherds were doing their jobs when, as verse 9 says, an angel of the Lord appeared to them and the glory of the Lord shone around them and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, don't be afraid. It's hilarious, isn't it? God is hilarious. Every, every visitation of an angel, it's always this. People are terrified and the angel always says, it's almost like they should have like, You know, the t-shirt that says, don't be afraid, right? The angel shows up, they're terrified. The angel, like all angels, says, don't be afraid. 
And then here's the message. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all people today in the town of David. A Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. And so there's kind of a process here of revelation. There's a message that the shepherds get. Good news of great joy. A Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. The message. And then there's a sign that goes with the message. So God gives them a message that I'm sure to them was like very stunning. What does that mean? And then they get a sign. You're going to find a baby wrapped in cloths, lying in a manger, and then there's like an action step, right? You have to go, they, they need to go and figure this thing out. To put the pieces together, they have to follow up on the sign. And I think that many times, not always, but it is common for God to show things to us this way. With a message and with a sign that we have to figure out. God gives them part of the information. He gives them this key core piece of the gospel. You shepherds, who by the way must have been dear to God's heart, the people everybody else looked down on, God chooses to reveal it to them. You shepherds, great joy, good news for you. And here's your sign and I was thinking this week, you know, there's different signs God could have given them, right? He could have said, you're going to find a baby whose parents are named Mary and Joseph. And that would be like a really hard coincidence to match. He could have, he could have said to the shepherds, go look through Bethlehem. You're going to find parents who are from Nazareth. And, and that would have been information that could have confirmed it. He, God could have given them lots of information. He could have said, go into Bethlehem and, and go to this street and the third house down on the left. Guess what? Something exciting is happening in this house. But he gave them a really personal sign. He said, go look for what? The word that occurs over and over again. Go look for a manger, a feeding trough, you animal people. You guys who watch animals out in the hills and are scorned, go look for the feeding trough because the king of the universe is coming in a feeding trough. Which is to say through this sign, the God who made everything is coming in a low fashion just like you. Like he's your God. He's your people. He's the God who doesn't rule on some majestic ivory throne, doesn't live in a palace you would never be admitted to, doesn't live in some temple where people would scorn you. He's coming just for you in flesh. And you're going to find him not where you would expect him, but in a trough. That is your sign. It's a shepherd's sign. It's a sign for humble people. It's a sign for people on the margins. The king of the universe is going to be in a trough. And so they have to go and figure it out. And I love this passage because I feel like it maps kind of right onto my life because I also got the very same message. Jesus is Lord and the sign God gave to me, which I tell regularly is, you didn't give your dead brother chicken pox. Information nobody else could have known. But it, would, it told me is, the God who made everything knows my deepest pain. And I had to go find out that I had believed a lie my whole life by following up with my parents. And, and it turned my life over. But that sign, it wasn't a sign that would mean something to most people. But to me, it meant like all the craziness in my life, God knew what it was all from. And God was intent to heal it. Like that was, that was a sign for me. And the sign for the shepherds was a manger. Your God loves you. And so pay attention. You know, when God speaks to you, if you're even on the edges figuring out spirituality, very often the real God, the God who actually made everything, the God who actually loves us, will speak to us about Jesus, but give us a sign to follow up on. Will give us, and it might be a Bible verse, it might be many things. There's 
all kinds of ways God speaks to us, but very often He speaks in a personal way to let us know that He loves us right where we are. So the joy of Christmas is it's revealed to us. It's a gift. It's a gift to be received. But it's, it's not only something that's revealed, it's also a revolution. Uh, the joy of Christmas is revolutionary. I want to step back a bit uh, and look at this passage from a, a, a different angle. It begins with these words. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree. And Luke does not just give us this information because he wants to help us date the passage or because he wants us to connect it with larger Roman history. I, I want to unpack just who Caesar Augustus is a little bit. He was the grandnephew of Julius Caesar. He, in, when Julius Caesar died, he said, Caesar Augustus, who at that time his name was Octavian, he's going to be my sole heir. And he gets to inherit everything. And when Augustus came to power, the, the Senate gave him the title Augustus, which meant ha, is, is, he's divine. So they changed his name and said, this is you know, sort of the divine Caesar. And they, in, in the old ways Roman, Romans do that don't make sense to us anymore, they said that Julius Caesar was, was God. And so one of Caesar Augustus' titles at the time was the Son of God. And so Caesar Augustus went by the title Son of God. He won battle after battle after battle after battle after battle, famously with, with Mark Antony, who uh, committed suicide with Cleopatra. But after many years of winning battles, they gave him another title, Soter, Savior. And so Caesar Augustus was called Son of God, Savior. And it was in Caesar Augustus' reign that Rome brought peace to the territory they controlled, basically by wiping out all of their enemies. And so he was Caesar, son of God, savior, bringer of peace to the world. And over time, they started to cel celebrate Caesar Augustus' birthday, and it became a national holiday. And whenever it was Caesar Augustus' birthday, they would announce it this way. In Greek, evangelion, good news. Good news. Today is Caesar Augustus' birthday, Son of God, Savior. Pretty familiar language to us, right? If you heard, if you just saw like an ancient announcement, hey, birthday, good news, this is the good news. It's the birth of a Savior, the Son of God. We, we might really attach that to the Bible, right? That's what they said about Caesar Augustus. And so when, when Luke writes this, this is like rolling a grenade out. You know, so often, last night I was driving home with our kids and in the yards in our neighborhood there's these blinking manger scenes. Do you guys have those? Like with the reindeer and, you know, the snowman in San Diego, which is weird in all sorts of ways. <laughs> and then the donkey and the manger. Rudolph and Jesus is right there. <laughs> It's like almost utterly bizarre. It's <laughs> utterly bizarre. And then there's Mary. And I actually like manger scenes. We have a manger scene that I love. And each year, you know, you can think about, should we do the donkey on the left and Jesus and Mary? Do you guys do that? Do you set it up and think about it? Like symmetry? Maybe this year we should do like sheep, sheep, donkey. Should we buy a cow just to give it a little symmetry? I don't know if there was a cow, but you know, we'll just have a nice looking. It's like very, very pretty, very, you know, it's just nice. It's very nice. This chapter, you know, this is not nice reading in the ancient world. It's subversive, revolutionary reading. Jesus, you'll find him wrapped in claws, Savior, Son of God, Lord, Caesar Augustus is Lord. Caesar is the same word. It's Lord Augustus. And so Luke is saying over and against the false Savior. You have heard of a false Savior who everybody knows is not a real Savior. Over and against that false Savior, a true Savior, a real King, 
a king of God's appointment has been born to you. Over against the false peace, we all know that Roman peace is a genocidal peace. Over and against that false peace, today you shepherds know that a real peace is coming into the world. The peace of the king of kings. Over and against the false son of God, who we all know is not really the son of any real God. God's actual son has been born today in the city of David, in the town where it was promised all along. And so this is, it's like in, you know, this passage that would just ripple out. That brought the seeds of revolution right into the heart of the culture. And in fact, Within a century, the entire Roman Empire was shaking, and within three centuries, the Roman Empire was crumbling as the gospel came in. And so as Luke you know, writes this for us, we have, to, we have to grapple with the revolutionary nature of the joy. The shepherd's joy is a revolutionary joy. It's a joy that, that turns everything upside down. And right at the heart of it is the, the idea that... Uh, The kingdom of God is invading this world. The kingdom of God has come in to bring down and to turn over the kingdom of this world. To bring a peace that this world knows nothing about. To bring a salvation that this world knows nothing about. You know, when we do announcements up here, I know some of us pay more attention than others. I won't name names, but I might might not keep a list. Anyway, um... As you walk outside, we're, there's a plant with purpose table, which if you think about it, is actually bringing revolution. Like actually bringing revolution by bringing the message of redemption to the rural poor in places where the kingdoms of this world are crushing people. Uh, Bridge of Hope, I think it's Friday night, right? It's having a party in City Heights. And yeah, if you want to participate in a really practical way in revolution, go to the Bridge of Hope this Friday night and worship in City Heights. And here's kind of the guarantee. Like if you just were to do that, like that's, that is stepping into the revolutionary joy of Christmas. Because in our, the kingdom of our world has this whole grid for what success and what the holidays look like. And if you just tell your work colleagues, I'm going to a party, it's in City Heights, you'll immediately get a question, right? Like, what are you doing in City Heights? Because everybody knows that's the bottom rung on the ladder. You know, it's not like... That's, that's not where the corporate office parties are aspiring to be held, right? That is not the sign that you've made it. It's bringing good news of great joy to the people on the margins in our city. To just the people Jesus has always been um, with and amongst. So go down and, and worship. And we step into that kind of revolutionary current of Christmas. I want to tell one quick story um, I ran into this week uh, reading Malcolm Gladwell's new book. There's a pastor named Andre Trocme, uh, pastored in the south of France on the Swiss border um, in the middle of this century. And many of you know that France fell to the Germans uh, in World War II. And across, uh, across France, uh, people had to start giving Nazi salutes. They were expected to tur- turn over the Jews. And Andre Trockme and his wife Magda were uh, just passionate followers of Jesus who from the beginning said, our town and our church are not going to do Nazi salutes. We're just not going to play. They were ordered to ring the bell, uh, the church bell, on the, an- on the one-year anniversary of the German takeover. And they said, our bell rings only for God. We, we are not going to ring the bell. Uh, uh, later in the uh, mid 40s, I think it was 43, uh, a large group of Jews were rounded up in Paris. And the kids in the church uh, sent a letter drafted by uh, Andre that I, I want to read a piece of because I think it's just wonderful. It says this We feel obliged to tell you that there are among us a certain number of Jews. So the letter protested what the French government was doing. 
in Paris, and then said, we want to tell you, because they had been starting to harbor Jews and inviting Jews and filling their schools with Jews, Jewish kids, we feel obliged to tell you that there are a certain number of Jews among us, but we make no distinction between Jews and non-Jews. It's contrary to the gospel teaching. If our comrades, whose only fault is to be born in another religion, receive the order to be deported or even examined, they would disobey the order, and we would hide them. The last sentence I love. We have Jews, you're not getting them. <laughs> Can you imagine writing that in proactively? They didn't have any reason to write it. It's just like back at you. You're bringing violence and disgusting oppression into our country, and so we're just going to write and say, we renounce and reject what you're doing. And because of Jesus, we make no distinction, and we invite Jews, and we harbor them, and by the way, you should know we have them, and you can't have them. The amazing thing is the Nazis never went after that town. They, um, both Andre and his wife Magda have been celebrated by the Jewish community for decades. They helped thousands and thousands and thousands of Jews get out of France. And, and part of what Gladwell says is the Nazis went after the people who were obviously afraid, just like dogs do. And the people who stood up and said, you know what, we have Jews and you can't have them. They didn't bother with. It's interesting, isn't it? The people who stood up in their face and said, because of the gospel, we make no distinction. That, to me, there is an embodiment of the revolutionary joy of Christmas. Like, we have experienced this joy that brings down the order of this world, where, where we see injustice and hatred. We, we stand against it. We subvert it. And then the last one, Joy of Christmas is not only revolutionary, it really requires a response. It requires a response. The shepherds, when they hear the news, they, they go immediately. And the news, the core of this, of course, is that Jesus is born a Savior. And people, you know, today that's like a religious word. What does Savior mean? I think the shepherds would have wondered, you know, Augustus was call, calling himself a Savior. What does Savior mean? And the Bible has like all these ways of of trying to help us understand Savior. What does Savior mean? What does it mean to be forgiven? What does it mean to be set free? Psalm 103 says it this way. As far as the east is from the west, that's how far God has removed our transgressions from us. If you're trying to get your head around it, that means that in Jesus, is, if you can just imagine the distance from the east to the west, that's how far God has removed our transgressions from us. That's one way of understanding what it means to be saved, to be just radically separated from our sin. Micah 7 says this, you hurl our iniquities into the depths of the sea. Like all that we've done wrong, God, you hurl them into the bottom of the ocean. Like they are gone and done with because of what Jesus did on the cross. That's what it, what it means to have a Savior. Isaiah 43 says this, I blot out your transgressions and remember your sins no more. Some of us battle day after day with like just remembering the things we've done wrong. And having a Savior means that God doesn't remember our sins. Like, think about that. Like, that thing that's plaguing me, God, the Bible says, doesn't remember it. As we place our faith in Jesus, it's taken care of, it's done with, it's separated, it's sunk into the ocean. It's not even remembered. That is amazing. Think about that. It's not remembered. Like, God, if he tried, could not recall it. Like, that's actually, that is hard to really grapple with. That is what it means to have a Savior. John Stott, a great writer, wonderful writer on the meaning of Christmas, says if you're wanting a word that's a synonym for salvation, one of the best words you could choose would be freedom. It's not only freedom from the guilt, but it's freedom from like bondage, freedom from having to go back and sin again, freedom from the chains to sin. That's what it, it means to have a Savior. And Luke sets us up, really, to wonder about how the shepherds are going to respond. In, in Luke chapter 1, Zechariah hears the news about something miraculous God's doing in his wife Elizabeth. And he says, how, how should I believe that? 
Like, that's crazy, even though it's an angel. And he loses his ability to speak. So we get this example of someone who hears good news and says, that's just, that does not, I can't, like, you've got to give me more. And then there's Mary in Luke chapter 1 who hears good news and does believe. And now we have the shepherds. And so it's like, how, what are they going to say to this announcement? How are they going to respond? And they respond by going and finding out that the sign is exactly as they had been told. And when they had seen him, that is the child Jesus, they spread the word concerning what had been told about this child. They go out and they spread the word. And then the shepherds return, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, key phrase in Luke, that they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. And so there's their two responses. They, they, they tell people what they've seen and heard, and they glorify and praise God because of it. And I want to just suggest to us, as we head into these last two weeks, that there, there's two responses for us. That, that we would do well to... Share what we've seen and heard, not more, not less. If you want to do that in a practical way, next week after second service, we're just going to go out into the neighborhood. We're going to put some flyers out for Christmas Eve um, just as a way of sort of sharing what we've seen and heard about Jesus, praying for this neighborhood, for this city. Another way would be just to, again, go to Bridge of Hope this Friday night, follow up, participate in the revolutionary joy of Christmas. And then secondly, that we would daily worship. Week by week, remember that Christmas is, at the very least, a call to surrender our lives and worship to Jesus our Lord. And so I'll stand. We're going to finish with the song. So worship team, if you guys could come up, and then we'll have an opportunity to pray and receive prayer. Let me pray for us. Lord, we praise you. For all that you did on the cross, we praise you for coming as a child and living a perfect life on our behalf. Lord, as we worship now, I just ask that you would wash away stress, wash away loneliness. We had a pretty intense word this morning as we were praying before service. Uh, someone had a, a, a specific sense that there is somebody here today really struggling with serious depression, not mild depression. Maybe it's obvious, maybe it's not. But if, if that's you, we would love to pray for you and during the response time. Let's worship. those verses about forgiveness if uh, that is not something you've experienced we'd love to pray with you the bible says that the forgiveness it's a it's available to all of us it's not distant it's within reach it begins with a simple prayer jesus would you forgive me that's a start of it we'd love to pray with you as far as the east is from the west. That's how far God removes our transgressions. That's the stuff we've done wrong from us. We'd also love to pray. We really, uh, if depression is an issue, we also uh, prayed a fair amount this morning about loneliness. If you come into the holiday season, maybe even your friends wouldn't know that you feel alone. I feel like God wants to just bring freedom to that this morning to bring rescue from that. Sometimes that big word salvation, it's really practical. It's really like right in the now. Sometimes it's as simple as God freeing us from a gnawing sense of being alone. You know, you can, you can uh, be in a big family and feel alone. You can be in a group of friends and feel alone. You can 
be in all kinds of circumstances and still feel like you're on an island. The Lord wants to free us from that this morning. So we'll hold hands across the aisles. We do this each week as a reminder that we're a community. And then if you'd like prayer, come on up and we'd love to pray with you. We are a community of joy because of who Jesus is and all that he has done. Lord, would you, in our hearts, cause joy to overflow? We ask just for a revelation, Lord. Would you open the eyes of our hearts that we might enjoy all that you have done for us. And Lord, I ask that your joy would flow out of us just like a spring, Lord. Just like an abundant spring of living water into the streets of San Diego, into our homes, Lord, into our friends' lives, Lord, into the lives of those who just get near us, Lord. I ask that there would be an overflow that just splashes on people, Lord, because of what you've done in our hearts. We love you, Jesus, and we go out in your name. Amen. God bless you guys. If you'd like prayer, come on up. Prayer team's up here. And you can get prayer for anything at all on your way out. Check out the tables. Do something revolutionary and wonderful this week.